Welcome to the final session of this conference and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers and discussants for coming here and um, doing such a great job. I personally very much enjoyed those two days. Also thank you for those in the audience uh, for joining us for that. Let me also thank you, thank those working in the background to make this happen, in particular Samuel and Julia. And um, last but not least, I want to thank Giancarlo Corsetti, who kindly accepted our invitation to act as uh, the final keynote speaker of this event. Giancarlo is the Pierre Werner Chair at the European University Institute in Florence. He is a fellow of the British Academy and acts as an advisor to several policy institutions in this world, including the ECB and the Bank of England. Giancarlo has uh, made many important contributions to, in particular, the areas of international and open economy, macroeconomics. He's published in the top journals in the, uh, in the profession on subjects like international risk sharing, financial crises, optimal monetary policy and open economy, but also fiscal policy, and in particular the fiscal multiplier, and I'm cutting that list off there. Um, let me maybe say on a little bit more personal level, two things that really impressed me about Giancarlo. One is that not only he's very productive academically, and if you look at his website, there's like a long list of works in progress and recently finished articles that are not published yet, but um, also he t t uh, spends a lot of energy on working uh, on policy advice. Uh, uh, and I think that for me personally, that's what macroeconomics is partly about. Um, and maybe some of you will uh, remember the event that we had uh, um, the policy discussion about the Geneva report on the policy mix um, about a year and a, a bit ago that was uh, uh, co-authored by Giancarlo, Agnes Benassi and, and co-authors. Uh, and these kind of things Giancarlo does, uh, I'm tempted to say, regularly. The second thing that impresses me is how much effort he puts into his students. And I had the privilege of uh, experiencing this firsthand when he was my supervisor. And, uh, UI a long time ago, I know it seems, but I remember that at the beginning of my PhD, I would come to his office with kind of vague ideas, and he'd be very excited nonetheless and give me lots of feedback and really take time. And as my PhD progressed, that, that continued in different forms, and even during the early stages, stages of my career, that, that, that kind of continued. And I'm not the only one. In fact, uh, if you look at the long list of students that are scattered around um, 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 the academic departments in this world and also uh, international policy institutions that kind of speak to this to this uh, this effort and color puts into the students but i want to um, finish this now and uh, <laughs> 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 and um, th thank you very much Giancarlo, yeah. for accepting our invitation and we're looking forward to your talk which i think you alluded already to uh, yesterday in the policy so th path. thank you for the kind introduction too kind uh, thank you for inviting me uh, and uh, i this is the first time I talk about this paper, although it's something that comes almost straight out of uh, teaching undergrads in uh, uh, Cambridge. And uh, uh, it was, uh, the reason why I wrote this is because I was invited to do a paper in honor of Maury Opsfeld for the conference at IMF in November. So I thought I would say, you know, there is a, a nice opportunity to think, rethink the literature. Uh, Krugman on currency crisis, Oxford on currency crisis, Calvo on that, on that default, and show that basically it's the same model, the same model. And then all of a sudden we realize with Bartos that it's actually more than that. It's actually a model that sort of uh, talks directly to the mood that is increasingly sour that many of us is like Klaus is gone, but so we have been facing a, a, a new world and uh, every time there is something there, we sort of always, there is an element of gambling in our, <laughs> in our policy response. No, there is an element uh, of wait and see, adjust partly, hoping that at one point maybe productivity will go up again, output will go up again, <laughs> so that there is this, uh, element of uh, uh, taking risks in the, in the policy decisions, maybe for good reasons. Maybe for good reasons. Actually, if anything, sometimes our models are too upfront. You, know? you want to do immediately everything. And, uh, but if you twist the model a little bit, there is always the possibility that it's actually optimal to, to wait. 
So it's a, it's a model to, to express this uh, uh, feeling in, in, in a framework where basically I would like to talk about uh, the inherent policy trade-off between uh, adjusting now to shock or adjusting later. Okay, so uh, take, take COVID. No, the COVID was horrible. <laughs> People thought about enormous adjustment coming. Then we realized that things actually were going back pretty quickly, uh, partly so. Uh, the euro area shock, the same thing, the euro area crisis, the, the great financial crisis. So we are inherent, we are inherently in this kind of uh, constant uh, trade-off between adjusting now or adjusting later. So uh, it could be good. Uh, the problem is that in this game, not only luck is important, but expectations. <laughs> so it's a, it, and this is why this paper is written in honor of Opsel, because Opsel has always come down with this idea that uh, there could be self-fulfilling, averts market sentiment, beliefs that uh, change the, the, the space in which policy decisions are taken. So I just wanted to tell you a story. So I don't know how many of you remember Krugman 79, currency crisis. Ob Obsfeld uh, 86 in the AR is the same thing as Krugman, except that the regime of inflation after the currency crisis happens conditional on the currency crisis happening. So <laughs> there is a, this self-fulfilling element. You know? If there is no currency crisis, there is no inflation regime. So there is no reason to have a currency crisis. If there is a currency crisis, there is. Yeah, inflation regime, so there is a reason for currency crisis, and the currency crisis happened. And then Calvo 88, which has become recently the one of the reference paper for uh, debt sustainability analysis and financial fragility. So the, the exercise is a very simple exercise. Uh, many of you may have read the paper on the fiscal tier of the price level. So uh, we use that. So there is a government who is initially in steady state, Everybody agrees that price should be stable. At some point, there is uh, a disturbance in the form of something that ma maps into a budget deficit, which is incompatible with the indefinite, sustainable, indefinite price stability regime. If nothing happens, the fiscal imbalance starts to create a rollover of debt that increases over time, because there is a strict positive interest rate. Uh, at some point, inflation will have to pay for the deficit, or if you want, there could be a default. Let me, I do like, if you read Calvo 88 paper, there are two sections, one with inflation, one with default. I do the same thing at this point. First, I, I think about the inflation pays for the deficit, then we'll talk about the. Now, the thing we do here is to say, okay, there must be a reason for a waiting, and this reason is a recovery, or, or a fiscal reform, or something that uh, may happen between now and some point in the future with some probability. Okay, so I take this very simple model where I don't do any welfare analysis, I just is all positive. There is a shock that starts to increase. The more I wait, the bigger the adjustment, but the adjustment may not happen in terms of inflation because there could be a, a recovery. The, 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 the default may not happen in terms, you know, because there could be a recovery or, or some kind of uh, political process that uh, addresses the imbalance and everything be, be becomes sustainable again. So it, it is a gamble, right? It is a gamble which is worth taking if, uh, you know, if there is a chance that the correction will take place. Uh, it's a gamble that clearly it's uh, less today against more tomorrow with some probability, okay? And a gamble that may be in, uh, feasible as long as the correction, required correction, the absent, the, the, the required, uh, um, uh, as long as the, the, the expected recovery or the fiscal reform is not beyond feasibility, political, economic, it's not too large, okay? So uh, I, I'll, I'll show you a very simple, very simple framework to think about this, uh, this trade-off and show how market beliefs come into play. So um, I'll talk, I, do, I will not talk Krugman, Obsfeld, Kalb, I'll talk straight fiscal theory of price level. 
Uh, the difference, main difference is that in the old literature, we're all like thinking about in terms of fiscal benefit of inflation in terms of senior age. But senior age is more, could be negative, uh, because now there is a tax base <laughs> there that is shrink when things go, go high inflation. So we, we go more into fiscal theories as the, no, the basement of the real content of nominal liabilities of the government, which may be long-term debt, but could also be government spending. Many government spending items are set in nominal terms, so inflation erodes the real part of those. Um, so any an imperfectly indexed commitment of spending or debt would do. Uh, I'll uh, show you that basically, once you do that, you realize that all this literature, paper in the literature, in the, in the papers in the literature were actually different specification of the same model. Um, Remember, the fiscal theory is basically a theory in which you don't have the fault because de facto, the central bank is pegging the face value of the of bonds, okay? If fiscal, the, so I, I will have the model twice. One, the central bank is pegging de facto the fiscal value, the, the face value of bonds. So all infl the, 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 the adjustment must go through inflation. If we stop that, then default become a possibility. Now, how do I uh, map what I'm doing to the fiscal theory literature? Well, it's very close. Uh, Cochrane, for example, in his book, makes the point, monetary policy can shift inflation over time as it pleases. Fine, this is exactly what we are doing. The gambling is, you wait. Uh, there is, however, a little bit of a difference in the sense that uh, I don't know if you look at Sims, the stepping on the rate model, you know, the, the, there is a dynamic of inflation smooth. We have a little bit of a simpler and, and perhaps, I think, more, more to, to in, in my mind, also more, more interest frame, general framework to think. And um, so we have a basically, you, you can keep inflation down for several quarters, several, several years, and at some point there will be a jump in the price. It's a simplification, just the level. We could do also inflation. Uh, so you'll see that we are we are using the fiscal theory uh, uh, model full time. So let me talk about the model, which is basically two equations, even one less than Francesco likes. <laughs> uh, uh, then I I I I will look at Krugman style delay inflation. Then uh, we'll say delay inflation with a rationale for doing so, because you want to make, you, you want to buy time for something to happen to rescue. Then enters market belief in this game, the time you can buy may be very long or very strong or very short, because it depends on how the markets see what you're doing. And then we take the model that is all f uh, uh, price jump, we change one variable and become Calvo 1988 model of, of uh, of uh, uh, default. So again, think about two extreme, all adjustment in prices or all adjustment in, uh, in, uh, in default. Okay, so uh, let's see. There are lo lots of slides, very verbose, apologies, it's just the first time we do this. Uh, the good thing is that if you have the slides, you can read the slides shorter than the, <laughs> than the paper and get all the the, the Result. So the, 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 the two, th there is one or two equations in the model. Basically, there is one uh, budget constraint where you know you have the government, continual private agents, and the unit interval. You have uh, long-term debt or nominal liabilities that uh, think of uh, BT, the bond ad traded at the price Q. Each bond pays a nominal coupon rho K. Uh, you know, and uh, this coupon is like falling over time, so that is a nice trick, as you know, many of you know. It's uh, a way to keep all the algebra at the minimum. Uh, the, the yield to maturity will be one over Q plus this rho. So that's the budget constraint. Uh, once the government pays, is there? Can you see this? Oh yeah, there. Not really, it doesn't matter. So the, the, once the, pa the government uh, um, pays the liab current liabilities, the, the current flow of uh, the maturing debt plus the, the, 
the, the, the, the material in that, then there is a primary, uh, a primary deficit there. Sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, I was confused by this thing. So the, fir the sorry, the, the, fir the first, the first uh, uh, constraint is considered a private agent. You have, um, let me start with the second state. I was talking about the second state. So once the, go the government pays these liabilities, this is the primary deficit minus the primary surplus, a issue QT, BT, and, and this is the private sector output minus consumption minus taxes or transfer, the payoff from the government debt and the uh, purchase on, on new bonds. Okay, so, uh, so those are the, the, the equations that I'm going to use, which is basically the once you solve for the optimality conditions of the private agent, including the terminal condition, uh, you, you see that uh, you, you really now Ponzi game and carefully, like Sims does, at the end uh, you have that the value of that today is equal to the present discounted value primary surplus. Uh, for simplicity, I in steady state, if S, uh, the primary surplus is uh, constant, you get the very, very simple equation number four. Hmm? So this, you don't understand why I'm using this with the undergrads, because it's very, very simple. <laughs> now it becomes slightly more complex, but Cambridge undergrads can take it. So, um, so this, those are the three specifications of the model. One is, uh, there is no reason to delay, but uh, you may want to see what is the trade-off between inflation now and inflation tomorrow. Second, there is a reason to delay because miracle can happen. Third, ways in which markets believe come into play. Uh, again, I don't want to talk about the regime of inflation rates, so just jump in the price level, just complicate the algebra, but it's very easy to, to have the general uh, uh, solution for inflation, different inflation rates. Okay, so re remember Krugman 79. Krugman 79 came to took the silent Anderson model and came to a d debate in which people say, oh, this currency crisis are a mess. It's all about uh, uh, investors, uh, belief-driven attacks. And he comes up with a model in which actually the equilibrium is unique. <laughs> there is no role for beliefs. And investors can calculate exactly the timing of the speculative attack just by looking at the amount of reserves that people, that people, uh, that the country has. Now, the, the, the modern version of the, uh, of, the mod of, the, of the paper, oh, by the way, Krugman does, talks about fiscal policy, but there is no fiscal policy in the model. I mean, it, it's a narrative about uh, using, <laughs> no, using the, <laughs> monetizing the deficit, but it's really like two different monetary regimes. So let's have fiscal policies in the center stage. So uh, suppose that starting with equation four, steady state, and now there is a deficit here. There is, I don't know, like COVID, the war, whatever you want, a, a drop in the output. So immediately you see that uh, given this uh, imbalance, equation number four in steady state cannot, th that equation cannot hold with a constant pre-shock P, a constant pre-shock Q. Either the price level might jump or the, or, or the uh, bond price must jump, which is a way to see the coming inflation crisis in the future. Okay, so either you have an immediate jump in the price level now, the question in the middle, or you have a jump in the price level in the future, which changes Q0, the question at the end, yes? So, so you're really thinking only about fiscal monetary responses and not, so to say, they hope, for example, R being smaller than G in a certain period? Or no, you can have, a, you know, like one way to do it would also, for example, a way I would do it uh, for the final exam would be to put the price of imports. Right. Okay. Which makes you think that actually that equation works with the G GDP that later, and then you have a relative price. Somebody asked today, the pay, pay in. So, that could be one, one <laughs> way to do it, or you could, you, you know, you can generate this. This is like a simple framework. You can generate uh, an underlying shock in many different ways. 
So, um, but I must be stupid, but why should the market price of my debt affect my liabilities? The market price of your debt? Yeah, this is Q0. Q0 is the price of bonds, right? So he prices the, he prices the, the expected primary, so it's a claim on, on, on the primary surplus, right? Now, the shock reduces the value, re reduces the value of the primary surplus, so the price of your debt must go down, because it's a claim to a, a pi which has ranked by delta. You see, the, the bonds are, are, are a claim to S over 1 minus B before the shock. Then become a, a claim to S 1 minus B minus delta, so the price must go down. So there is an outstanding debt. Okay. There is an outstanding debt. Yeah. There, there yes, is. Yes. So, so it, it's like default, basically. It is. Like, it is at the basement. It's, it is a form. It's a form. It's a form of. A, it's not a breach of a formal contract because if my contract say, these are clearly for countries that have their own currency and that denominated their own currency. These are not debt contracts. These are almost equity. Yeah. Exactly. I pay the sub the primary surplus yeah. to the people who hold. That exactly. This yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. Cochrane has been very very vocal on this like for a long time. So okay, fine. So uh, if you look at. This is, I, I borrow from Krugman, shadow interest rate, shadow price, meaning th th those, the plot there would be, what would be the value of the price level if the crisis happens at T? Okay, so it, like, this is like something, would be the equilibrium, what would be the equilibrium value of the price level? Thinking, you know, like one, two, three, four, delaying, delaying, delaying. This shows basically the more, the more you wait, the larger the, the required jump in the price level to the base the, the debt, because in the meanwhile, the debt is growing through the interest rate accumulation. Uh, the required jump in the, the required bond yield, the, the, sorry, the shadow bond yield would, would go up in the, sa the, sa the same way. Uh, the interest rate would go up the same way. Because you know you see one period ahead the crisis and the interest rate is increasing with expected inflation, a and that is also go going up pretty steeply. So this is what happened. For example, imagine that uh, the the banks decide to have the jump in the price level for any reason at time t equal ten. For any reason, maybe you want to wait for the elections or whatever, right? t, t equal ten. So I, this is a world in which, for the longest time, pri the price will, become, will remain flat. So the short-term interest rate will become flat, because there is no inflation one period ahead. The bond, however, immediately will see the inflation coming. So it will come down. The price of the bond will come down. And will keep going down, because remember, every period, you know, there is this increase in the size of the adjustment. Then at, at T12, there will be the, the, the adjustment. So at, at time 11, the interest rate, one period will shoot up because you see the, the coming inflation the next period. And uh, uh, you, you will have the adjustment in the price. I'm assuming here that, that the adjustment in the price would basically reestablish sustainability. So this is exactly Krugman 79. It's the way you, you solve for Krugman. In a way, yes, you need to know what happened at the end. I said, I said that here, the, the, yeah, there is a deficit versus. Here, there is no correction of the deficit. It only comes through, through price. I monetize it today, I let it jump. Yeah. That's no, today, yeah, today will be the, the, the solution, right? The solution here at T12 is the delay solution. Now, uh, 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 basically, what I'm going, what, what you see here is what the FTPL people call uh, initially M is active and F is passive. So the central bank choose, choose prices and, and the fiscal adjust. This is the initial steady state. Then there is the shock and the shock reverses this. F becomes, uh, uh, F becomes active. There is a shock that will not be corrected and M becomes passive. At one point it needs to adjust the price level. Now, there are two questions, right? What determines capital T and what, why delaying T? 
Krugman answered the first question, what determines capital T, by positing this lower bound on, interest, on, uh, on uh, international reserves with uh, a constraint on, on domestic credit, which means it basically posits a, a lower bound on M, which is basically an upper bound on the interest rate. If you know that you cannot contract money supply is up to a beyond certain point, it's like say that there is a high a, a upper bound in interest rate. And this is exactly what we write a long time ago with, with, with Bartos. We wrote this paper in which you had this upper bound. We, we rewrite Krugman with this upper bound in interest rate. But it's, it's a little bit boring, right? I mean, <laughs> it could be, but it's, it's weird because there is no reason to wait here. So a simple way, way to, to think about a reason to delay is the fact that something may happen that eliminate the need for a price adjustment, okay? So now let's do a, a second round in the model in which we uh, suppose that uh, there is always a chance that there will be a correction, omega, that will completely eliminate the need for any price adjustment. What is the correction? A rebound of uh, in, uh, the output, a, a, a government particularly smart, <laughs> whatever. Uh, we, we leave it uh, completely open. The point is that, remember, I, there is a reason for, for, for delaying, but we, I need a way to set the T, set the, the time of delay. And I, I do the same trick as Krugman, which is I say that thi thi this correction omega is bounded above. Okay, so the correction is, f I can expect a correction with some probability unless it becomes too large. Okay, so how long will the monetary policy be able to preserve price stability? Well, you know, you, you cannot wait too long because at one point there will be a natural collapse. Uh, at one point the required correction will be too, 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 too high. So if, if, the, if the correction does not happen, I can calculate exactly the time t in which price stability is no longer defendable. But it could be that the correction happened before. So what does the correction do to the FTPL Krugman model? Well, you know, it makes the, the, this, this graph, remember the, the graph, it was going up pretty steeply. Here, the, the possibility of a correction sort of flattens out, no? because you anticipate maybe there is no need for a correction. And on top of that, creates the possibility that uh, all of a sudden there is a recovery and you don't need to change prices. So here is a graph, it's a little bit difficult to, to read. I, I need to rewrite this, but the point is that th there are two cases. One in which at T12, uh, the correction has not happened and go, everything goes through price adjustment. And one in which at time T equal 12, the correction happened to occur, <laughs> okay? So at the very, you know, th there is like a doom day in which you could, things could go bad, bad or, or, or good. Why do I do this? It's because you see that the evolution of certain variables are the same in the two cases, right? The, the price level remains fixed, interest rate remains fixed, right? The, the, the required physical correction in the meanwhile is increasing by, because again, the, the debt is rolling up. The bond yield is, is falls down, you know, it has the, this element of uh, of anticipation for T, T, T12. So um, uh, it's basically, a, 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 th there is no reason for the fiscal correction, of course, to happen on T12, could, could happen any time before. But you see the dynamic of the model in which uh, you, ha you may have, uh, you may be on, on a unsustainable, conditionally unsustainable path for the debt, right? The debt is increasing. You have total price stability, right? The only thing that makes this model difficult to take to the data is actually the bond yield. I mean, you, you have basically, those are, uh, this is a model in which since you know that things may go wrong, you have the yield curve that immediately goes up a lot, <laughs> steepens a lot. So in, in many cases, when there is a fiscal problem, if we don't see the bond yield for a casting, <laughs> no, we don't see that the steep bond yield. So this is a model that you know is fine, 
he has a, a reason to, 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 to wait, but he has this a little bit of con counterfactual point, which is financial market should see it coming. Should see it coming. So, um, what is interesting here is that uh, you have a, a basically for any given sequence of shocks, you have uh, a unique equilibrium, which is if, if the correction does not occur, there's a unique T at which price must jump. And you gamble on the fact that something happened before capital T. Okay, so you have a, a lot of luck here. A lot of luck. Remember the story by, what's his name? Yogi Berra, no? In, in, in uh, baseball, 80% something, so say something, 80% is physical, the remaining 90% is mental. So in life, success, 80% is how good you are, 90%. The remaining 90% is luck. This would be the same thing for the current government. Some luck would, would, would help a lot. So uh, there is a nice map into Krugman, which is uh, there is a reason to postpone that Krugman does not have. Uh, in contrast to Krugman, perhaps we don't need to have a, a, an adjustment in prices. But the parallel is that we can calculate a unique equilibrium. Hmm? And uh, I didn't put any names. Maybe some of you have written paper. This passive active random switch on monetary and fiscal policies in many papers. There is nothing new here. There are many, many people who have done that. So uh, the only thing that I guess I don't like is the fact that uh, uh, this bond yield, we, we don't see the bond, the, 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 the term structure steepening when there is a... a, a how is the bond yield defined here? Sorry, I can't. Oh, it's the the it's basically one over Q minus rho. So it's basically the the inverse of the price correct for the coupon. Eh? Okay, so uh, I'm doing well. So uh, ca 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 can we trust luck? Is this gamble worth taking? No. Now, the problem is that this gamble is extremely fragile. And this is an optional contribution to the theory of the currency crisis that become a contribution to today's discussion. Because basically, there are millions of ways in which you can think of feedback effect between belief and, and this gambling, right? So a simple one is to assume that the probability of fiscal correction is decreasing in the size of the correction. So a small correction is more likely than a large correction. So the more you wait, the higher the correction, the lower, <laughs> you know, you lose faith on the idea that there will be a huge increase in output, a huge budget the consolidation no, of, of some kind that makes sense for. So the, this creates immediately a feedback between market beliefs and, and the uh, uh, outcome. So it, it raises it creates multiple equilibrium and uh, self-fulfilling crisis. So uh, the, the narrative is very simple. Suppose that we are optimistic. So we like Lagarde, we like our governments, we think that they can do it. We know that there is a, you know, we know that it may not happen, but it's better to wait. We don't want to, we don't want to suffer now. We may suffer more tomorrow, but it's with some probability, right? So given this belief, basically, the, the bond price will be high, right? And that means that the correction is actually endogenously moderated, and the probability of correction is higher. <laughs> okay, so this is a beautiful way. No, I, I'm optimistic. I think, you know, we can do it, no? We can do it. Um, so uh, uh, these optimistic moods are validated by the model, beautifully. Suppose that agents say, OK, we can be like this for another 10 years, right? Then everything is like before. But look, the beautiful, so this would be another, another case like before. The correction happened at time t equal 10, case 2, versus the correction does not happen, right? I just confront the two cases. But what is beautiful in these two cases is that the bond yield does not move. 
there is no steepening because the, the optimistic uh, mood of markets go into go into this anticipation of uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the uh, success that makes uh, the path of the required correction lower and the probability of, of that happening higher. And, the, and this is priced by the market. Okay? So, um, it, it, uh, Cochrane has many other ways to do this with discounts and everything, but this is actually pretty much a reasonable way to interpret the logic of the model, no? where this interaction between beliefs and outcome uh, creates the, the uh, appearance of, of everything is going to be fine, right? <laughs> everything is going to be fine. The, the price of the bonds hardly move. So they, um, for some time, at least for some time, then of course, after a while, people start to, even optimistic people start to say, wait a second. <laughs> like, uh, the, there is a moment in which we may, we, we may revise uh, we, we see the, the, the doom day coming and nothing has happened, no? So there is a revision there. Now, but what happened under pessimism is the scary part. Because the moment in which you think that, you know, it's not worth to take the gamble, then you immediately see, no, you, you price that very, high, very low, the, the interest rate goes up, the, the correction, the self correction starts to go very steep, and the probability falls very, very, very quickly. Okay? So you have uh, basically, you, you give no time for, a, you, you give no chance for the correction to, 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 to come up. Fantastic, no? I can't sleep tonight with this thing, but it's because you see that, uh, you know, everything, you know, price is stable, bonds, prices are high, spreads are low, and then bang. And, and things unravel very quickly. Remember, the equilibrium in this model always comes into three, no? So you have two stable and one unstable. So there is actually another equilibrium with T equal four, which will be unstable, meaning that it's an equilibrium where the relation between the interest rate and bond and, and, and the stock is reversed. You know? more, more interest rate lower. But that's okay, just this is a technical, technical issue. So what is the insight from, from this model? Well, you know, uh, it, the, the success of the gamble depends on the regime of expectation. For the same sequence of exogenous shock, uh, the gamble may or may not fail. Suppose, for example, that the correction will happen at time six. If people believe that capital T is 10, the correction will happen. If people are pessimistic, there will be no chance. No, the, 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 the the model w will require a, a price jump already much before, at two or four. Four is a strange case because it's the, the non-stable non equilibrium, but this is well known. So uh, uh, this is what I like, I insist on this point. So it's, it, it is seen by the market, but the optimistic mood actually iron out the response of the bond. So bond yield and prices remain pretty stable. And this one makes things particularly unsettling, right? <laughs> because it, it is so linked to, to a, a very delicate equilibrium with market Do uh, you have any questions? Because basically, I, I just want to finish that uh, it's belief, but there is still luck. <laughs> luck plays a, a big role here because uh, uh, it matters, and I'm afraid that it matters in our life. Current. Macron Thanks, Janka. No person. No. I have a question. I uh, I am not very familiar with this literature, but um, you seem to be speaking of uh, waiting as gambling, and then when the action is taken, that's when the inflation comes. But what um, I understand. Now, inflation is already here, you know, in the real world, and now the uh, action is whether to raise interest rates or not. And the danger is that something can happen to Italy, you know, and it's that sustainability. Yeah, so this is fantastic. I, I, I get so to that. I so that's to that. my question. No, no, yeah, yeah, sure. 
just as you, you must be a, a, a half is made of Bartos because we <laughs> no, we, we have been discussing this. Of course, one second only. Then we, we go to that. Now, um, uh, this for, for you who, who like uh, the literature, all literature, there is a clear parallel with Oxford, 86, where basically the, the change in the regime and the market beliefs are in, interlinked by this belief game. And, uh, uh, you know, Makovia, Bassetto, Miller, uh, I'm glad that Martin is not here because he will say, I wrote a paper also. Martin, uh, uh, where is Uribe? He's 80, 80, 80, um, 2006, also he has a paper with the same kind of game. So, um, now what is interesting about this model is that if you take the model, you change a variable, you have a model of uh, default with self fulfilling crisis. Okay, literally, it's just a change in variable. If you ever read the Calvo 88, it's the same thing. Literally, it's just a change in variable. And the change in variable is to replace the jump in the price with the uh, equilibrium haircut on bond. So a jump in the price reduces the value of the debt proportionally. You just replace the jump in the price with theta, which is the same proportion in terms of a haircut on a bond holder. Okay? So everything I say, what? Well, that, 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 that there would be a Q. You see, Q sees the haircut coming, so the, the price of the bond will will drop when you see the a, a drop in the real value of the surplus that you get holding that bond, right? The, the, the drop in the real value may come from a outright default in terms of a haircut or through a debasement. So th that's what the model does. And if you read Calvo 88, it's exactly like this. One section real, one section nominal. On top of that, if you ask Guillermo why he wrote the paper, he said, well, I wanted to talk about the self-fulfilling inflation coming from fiscal policy in Brazil. So he wrote first the, the nominal paper. Then he sent it to the AR, and the AR say, well, no, we are macro guys. We only look real. So he had to rewrite the paper <laughs> with the real section. And what he did, he, he literally put, <laughs> he translated. So we, we, have, we come full circle. But we come full circle in a way that is extremely relevant today. Because you know, this element of gamble, we have been living through it for now many, many years. So this is what I want to say. Like, you know, like uh, you have, uh, oh yeah, Martin is here, Uribe 2006. Right? So like you, you, have, uh, you have this literature which sort of maps into this very simple framework, which again can be complicated the way you want. And you no, know, Bartos has written a, two, a paper already complicating it, making it more uh, thing. So um, let me stop here one second, then I go to Anton, Anton question. If you have any, any question about this. Uh, Martin, you have a Knowledge of sense. Should we gamble? So, uh, you have an endowment economy. Do you dare to look into the ex ante? Of course, ex post, it will be if we are lucky, uh, then of course, gambling was great. That's a, a great question, and it's a great question for two reasons. Um, first, especially in the literature on uh, debt crisis, there, there are uh, uh, models that are great, but uh, they tend to um, in a normative sense to go away from gamble. So all the literature on, on, on crisis coming from Colin Kio, those are models that generate a tremendous incentive for uh, deleveraging. So you want to deleverage like crazy there. So you, don't, you, you want to get out of the gamble as soon as possible. Model a la Calvo give you the gamble as an optimal May, may, it's not always the case. It depends, right? And the, 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 the paper I wrote, we look at the dollar some time ago on uh, monetary backstop as exactly this element. There, we don't go all prices, all default. It's actually together. You can do a mix of the two. And uh, in, in that paper, there is clearly situations in which waiting is, is 
Remember, it's, it's an intertemporal, no? it's, 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 a, it's, it's an intertemporal choices, depending on probabilities and things, it may be worth taking the, the path or not. The problem with Calvo is that he kills you with this self-fulfilling stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, actually the paper we look at the dollar was, was done as a rationale for OMTs in Europe, saying that uh, once you have a self-fulfilling crisis, clearly it, it moves against you, the bet, right? It may move. So I if you can eliminate self-fulfilling, actually it makes the intertemporal choice a little bit cleaner. So the, 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 answer to the simple answer is that uh, if you do proper analysis, there are lots of situations in which gambling is better. Uh, it's always contingent on how you write the cost of default. <laughs> there are many, many, many ad hoc there, like, or like consensus uh, shortcuts, right? But uh, in this literature, in my view, one problem with the gambling is that uh, we have a, a very limited uh, grasp, empirical and theoretical, on the endogenous cost of these choices, right? So we put some exogenous cost and we take the best choice. <laughs> but we know that those costs are not exogenous, right? It depends on the way, in the, it depends on your behavior, right? So, so it would be nice, w w what I'm saying is the fact that we will be forced as profession by the wave of the fall that potentially may come in the next few years to rethink the way we think th this, these problems where uh, 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 if you want either in the outright default literature or the, or the restructuring literature. There are lots of intertemporal choices to be made. So having a little bit of a more empirically based grasp of the consequences of this, these choices would, would, be, would be good. So the short answer is gambling may or may not be good. The presence of multiple equilibria usually creates more, more uh, prob problems, but do not eliminate gambling. Y you, you may still have sunspot equilibria where, where the fact that you have a threat of a multiple equilibria uh, of a self-fulfilling crisis in the future is not enough for you to, to try to get out of the gamble. You still want to take gamble there. You may imagine it depends on the probabilities, on the cost and all these things. Is one difference between the fiscal, between the default um, version of the model and the monetization version of the model, the effect that monetization reduces the value of all nominal assets, while the default are <coughs> to government bonds, so you may think that there are better, sub, you know, people might want to switch to substitutes early on, you might get a kind of diamond diptych kind of, or a, a but I think this is what I was saying, that we, we would like to have a little bit of a more better grasp of the trade-off and the effect of this decision. This is, this, is, this is a good example. Already, like remember, most of the models where, that we, assu we, 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 have, we assume complete default, which almost never happened because we know that the modalities of default change quite a bit what happened in, in, uh, later, no? And just say that unfortunately, I think as a profession, we'll be forced to go into this literature because I'm afraid that <laughs> no, it's unescapable in a way. So it, it would be good to, it's actually, it would be intellectually good to, 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 to move. Um, no, no. Yeah, I, I have a, a paper where I was thinking exactly about this type of, of gamble, and I ended up using um, what Wishing Me and, and Leaper have used which is this uh, fiscal limit uh, approach with uh, regime switching on the public expenditure. Uh, and although I, I, uh, I think I, m I managed to make a point why the LTRO and so on were good in delaying and uh, helping the, the fiscal side adjust, it was very reduced form on the political economy side, which I think was where the spirit of all this regime switching came from. So. I think it would be it would be super interesting, especially when the incentives of governments to delay, and sometimes this gamble might be very suboptimal, but very useful for a government that wants to delay. So no, no, I, agree. I, I just yeah, I completely share the idea that this had uh, is a bit lost, and the way I did it was extremely reduced form, um, and I think that there could be much scope for improving uh, the literature. R remember, there is also this kind of uh, language. We say there is the strategic default versus the fiscal limit. 
I mean, in a way, both of them, you can think of them as coming from the same model, right? Because it's just the way you write the, co the utility cost of, or, or the real cost of default, you, you may be stuck at the fiscal limit. <laughs> or or you, you may. Now, the problem with the, the strategic default is that many of the, of the model come with this view that it's always good to do as soon as possible, right? <laughs> there is always this feeling that we wait for too long, the restructuring goes. So I think if, 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 to go to a better normative analysis, it would be good to have a better positive analysis, understanding what are the constraints and what are the factors that, that bring you there. So I, I, we are running out of time. So uh, this is the uh, Anton unsettling question. So what are you talking about? We already have inflation. <laughs> so this is what, what, what we could do. So with, uh, with, with Bartos, we say, OK, so, so, oh, sorry. Um, no, let me, let me do the Bartos thing and then the conclusion. So we start to say, okay, suppose we want to do the economist trick. We just apply this model literally to reality. What would be the, what would be the, the what, what can we say? So after a little bit of debate, we say, okay, maybe we are already past the time T. So the inflation that we see now, despite all the manifestation is already, is already an element of, of the basement. Okay, so uh, uh, so in a way, you know, like uh, if that if that is your belief, if this would be Cochrane being happy to see inflation, and then he would say, let's go. If, let, actually, let let it go, <laughs> because we need we need a certain level of inflation to the base. Another interpretation is that actually the gamble. This is my favorite interpretation. The gamble is still on, <laughs> right? And uh, we have a sequence of shock that make the gamble actually more complex and the cost of adjustment even larger. So, um, uh, and, 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 and one of the things that makes me think of this is the fact that still, you know, inflation expectations remain fairly anchored. Uh, we, we, we don't see the kind of uh, doom day on, on price level of that, uh, that uh, uh, John Cochrane would, would, would say is, is required. But uh, again, it's, um, this is a very stylized fact. Actually, if anything, it would be nice to have uh, this kind of framework going into m models, even so simple, but just making the difference between uh, CPI and GDP deflator and the terms of trade already gives you more, more, more action. So I, I could write exactly the same model with some inflation coming from energy and commodity prices, for example. And, and still have the same, the same, uh, the same outcome. So uh, I hope I've entertained you with this thing. Very simple. Uh, uh, it, it is just the, 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 it's not the beginning because I've been thinking about this gamble for a long time, but I think he, the, 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 your question would be m more and more relevant, right? So in all the choices that uh, we, we, we are taking now, there is this, 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 this element which may be interesting to, 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 to investigate more. So um, uh, again, I, I, w we look at, we have a model with a, a positive normative analysis that tell you the story that uh, I say, but it's still a model on normative analysis condition on many exogenous assumptions that have become acceptable. A few years ago were not acceptable, not that all of a sudden became acceptable but uh, they may not be taken for granted. Let me stop here. Yeah, we have time for questions. Francesco. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that you observe many interventions to, uh, to stop the rise in inflation that will uh, actually imply a higher fiscal correction in the future, can this affect the belief of agents, the fact that the gamble is probably not uh, sustainable? Because implicitly we are really intervening a lot, so increasing we, the we, we don't know the need for we, future correction. We don't correction. have a good theory of beliefs, not beliefs formation. Beliefs. So yes, it is, it is possible. It is possible. It is definitely a possibility. So we tend not to like. We always uh, bad equilibrium, good equilibrium. The good equilibrium, the optimistic is always good. <laughs> so we tend not to like. Uh, and, and remember, the the bad equilibria as the as a um, 
If, if you look at the early documents of the uh, IMF, I, I, there is already this theoretical issue, which is if eliminating bad equilibria has no moral hazard consequences. So in principle, you don't want to have uh, conditionality, right? I mean, suppose that there, there is a, a costly effort to do something. If I'm in a good equilibrium, there will be a reward on my costly effort. If I'm a, in a bad equilibrium, my costly, the, the benefit may be squandered by the, the, the crisis. So why, you know, like, it's actually the opposite. You have more incentive to do the right policy if you are guaranteed against the bad equilibrium. The problem is that you never know, <laughs> like, you never know <laughs> whether it's purely purely liquidity or, or become fundamental. So if you look at the, early, the history of uh, this beautiful, very early model, um, intervention by Fisher that explains why you need to have this, you know, the, the, the approach of the model by uh, the IMF in which, in a way, there is this element of saying, we, we, we want to eliminate liquidity crisis, at the same time create incentive to do the right thing uh, as a conditionality. No? So I don't know whether it's clear what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that, that there is the moral hazard is in the insurance where the transfer exposed is for sure, right? So you have an insurance. You, you, you lose your, your, your you, 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 you don't take all the necessary pre precaution to uh, avoid the fire. So that, that is a, a clearly a moral hazard aspect. But the multiple equilibrium is, is something different. So because there is no transfer exposed if the bad equilibrium does not happen. But the point is that you, nev you never know. <laughs> and also like in, uh, in everything, uh, also when you eliminate good equilibrium, you can have a residual trouble coming from bad shocks, no? Be more so is there is always this element of uh, interconnection. I'm, I'm saying things that are pretty banal, but uh, yeah, we will leave with them for quite a bit in, the, in Europe and elsewhere. Yeah, maybe maybe a question about um, monetary and fiscal coordination, so to say. Like, so you were always assuming, or like the the idea was, the longer you wait, the larger the adjustment must be, right? But you you can imagine that the shock of adjustment is not big enough. So so do you think about like the rest of the gap being filled by monetary policy then, or, or sure, sure, this sure. No, this is the model with Luca. Luca, we have both. Yes. And, and one of the uh, uh, prediction of the model that fits reality is that period of default are always inflationary. And if you think about uh, uh, public finance principle, you want to use all the instruments, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. it is, uh, uh, y y you could rewrite this model with share, but I would do it normative, no? And to do normative, again, we, we come back to a model, uh, uh, what, what also bothers me is the fact that often we write a model and we look at the only a part of the model. So if you sort of, <laughs> uh, um, the, 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 there is a variety of crises that happen in our model. It could be rollover, it could be slow moving with the accumulation. You could have crises where you go from a, a, a safe, safe interest rate to a, a disappearance of the market. So sometimes we, we, are, we are too, um, focus on, on one part of the model. No? So this is actually, I'm, I'm writing this paper with the student uh, uh, j just to have a little bit of a better uh, complete pictures of what kind of crisis one can, can, can for a given fundamental, what kind of crisis you, you, you can face. I think we're all a bit tired. There are no more questions. And, and, and I think I speak for all of the organizers. Let me thank can you again. The last statement. Uh, of course. The last statement is the following. Yesterday, I was a little bit, uh, when Jill's in the room, we always get, we always get an animosity. But the, the, there is one thing that we missed yesterday that it should, should be said about the, 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 the dollar, which is the fact that yesterday we discussed about who is late, the Fed, the ECB. Then we say, okay, 
the, the ECB may have reason to have lower interest rate, to increase interest rate by less than, than the Fed. And that is price in the, in the change rate. Uh, now, the direction of the movement of the change rate is actually correct, is monetary, the monetary model, like we were saying. The level we don't know because there is a, an element of uh, safe asset risk and everything. So the direction is good, the level is not clear whether the level is completely explained by the relative monetary sense. But the risk that uh, many people see, Opsal has written, I also agree with him, is the fact that uh, we forget that uh, we have a system where mo this kind of monetary policies which tend to become very correlated. And in a situation like this, there is a true risk of overdoing it. <laughs> because every country is sort of looking at its own up or gap in inflation and, you know, like uh, the paper now, you, you want to increase interest rate, forgetting that globally we are all contributing to the slowdown. I'm saying this because this will map into what I'm saying pretty much. Not only Europe, actually worldwide, there will be the change in the global monetary stance will create uh, enormous tension on the global debt. And as you know, already 80 plus countries went to the IMF for help during the COVID period. <laughs> we could have uh, a, a very complicated years to come. So I, 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 there is also this international dimension that during this conference we never mentioned, but uh, we should, <laughs> we should. What? Uh, yeah, exactly. We should, we, should, we should be faithful to the, to the Thank you we'll very much. make sure we keep Thank that in mind for our next conference uh, next year. Thanks a lot, Giancarlo, and thanks again, everybody, for coming. And we hope to see you soon for some other event. Thank you. Thank you.